The Peter Schiff Show. Well, the Dow Jones got clobbered again today, down 252 points at the close, but that's about 100 points above the intraday low. The Nasdaq, again, down about 55. I did see it down over 80 earlier in the day. The transports continue to get clobbered down another 146 points. Now we've done, what, maybe about 21, 22 percent decisively in bear market territory. But, you know, CNBC from the moment I woke up, was blaming the entire decline on North Korea's potentially having tested a a hydrogen bomb. Now, I admit that the prospect of the North Koreans having a hydrogen bomb is, is, is not a good one, but I don't believe that news announcement had anything to do with today's decline. I mean, I think the market would have declined anyway, even if, even if uh, North Korea had not uh, tested that bomb, uh, they would have blamed it on something else. But the real uh, problem is the Fed taking away the monetary heroin from all of the addicts uh, on Wall Street, and this is the withdrawal. And, you know, there was a Fed official, former president of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, Richard Fisher, was on CNBC yesterday. And I can't believe some of the things he actually said. But he admitted that he and his buddies at the Federal Reserve engineered, and that was his word, engineered a stock market uh, recovery rally, that they front loaded uh, a bull market. He said this. And he said the Federal Reserve did it deliberately to create a wealth effect. Yes, they wanted to create all this phony wealth uh, based on a artificially pumped up stock market. They wanted all this phony wealth to cause us to make stupid, irrational, reckless decisions, right? Because that's what happens when you create phony wealth. That's what happened during the dot-com bubble. It happened to a greater extent during the housing bubble, right? Those were That was the prior wealth effects that the Fed created. And here you have it from the words of a former uh, Fed uh, president, a voting member who voted, you know, for QE1 and 2, right? Who's saying that the Fed did this to create a wealth effect. Well, what does that do? It's phony wealth. And as a result of that, we do all sorts of things that we shouldn't do and that we wouldn't have done had we not been operating under the delusion that all this phony wealth was legitimate. And what's happening now is we're waking up from this Fed-induced high, right? The stimulus is just starting to wear off. Even though there's still plenty of it, there's not enough, right? Because they got us used to an enormous dose. And now they've reduced the dosage, right? And this is, you know, it's not enough, right? The high is wearing off. And he even said, hey, what do you expect? He goes, don't be surprised if the market goes down 20%. He said it's still overvalued. And he admits that the Fed was propping it up. So obviously, if the Fed is removing the props, the market is going to go down. But normally, the Fed officials don't speak this candidly about their role in creating the problem, although he still didn't quite admit it. But then Simon Hobbs, right, who was on CNBC, he was the guy interviewing him, but he he was kind of startled by what he was hearing. And he basically said, hey, you know, well, wait a minute. Are you going to apologize for this? I mean, if the stock market comes down, are you going to apologize for overstimulating? And this is what he's saying. Again, I'm not making this up. You should go watch the whole video. It's up on YouTube. I favorited it on my YouTube channel. I linked it on my Facebook page. But this is what the guy said. And nobody is really talking about it but me. I mean, even on CNBC, where they actually interviewed the guy, they didn't talk about it, right? That's why you got to listen to my podcast, because I get into things that nobody else picks up. But this is what he said. After Simon Hobbs said, are you going to apologize for what you did? He said, well, don't blame me. I voted against QE3. And then he went on. So in other words, he said, I don't have to apologize because I voted against QE3. In other words, he is throwing all of his former colleagues under the bus because by saying, don't blame me, I voted against QE3, what he's saying is you can blame everybody who voted for it, which would include Janet Yellen. Now, of course, he said, look, I voted for QE1 and 2, but you know, if we didn't have QE1 and 2, there wouldn't have been a QE3. So I don't care 
that he voted against QE3. The fact that he supported the first two makes him culpable. And I also think it's very interesting that now that he's no longer there, he's no longer at the Fed, now he's talking about all the, the bad things the Fed did. In fact, he referred to the Fed as a giant weapon that is now out of ammunition. <laughs> well, unfortunately, he was using that weapon. He was, you know, he was wielding the weapon, but you know, it isn't out of ammunition. I don't know what he's talking about. They've got all the ammunition they've always had. What's their ammo? Cut rates. Well, they can cut them because now they've raised them. They're above zero. And of course, they can go below zero. Janet Yellen's already talked about the fact that, well, they're studying negative rates. Well, that means they're going to do it. And of course, they're not doing QE right now. They can ramp it back up again. That's their big bazooka, QE4. So what is Fisher saying they're out of ammunition? I mean, if they're out of ammunition now, they never had any ammunition. But again, it's not real ammunition. It's just ammunition that does damage. It's a weapon of destruction. It's not a weapon of creation, right? The Fed doesn't have any way to create, but it sure does have a way to destroy. And in that respect, uh, Fisher is right, but he's wrong to say they're out of ammo. There's plenty of ammo left and there's plenty of destruction left uh, because that weapon is going to be fired and it's going to be fired big and it's going to be fired a lot sooner than, than people think. But this is why the market is going down. It's not because of uh, a North Korea. And in fact, again, every once in a while, you know, Joe Kernan is there on CNBC. He's talking to Steve Leishman. And again, he says the market's going down, and he, and he says to Steve Leishman, you know, if the market keeps going down, I'm going to have to call you out and your buddies at the Fed. You know, maybe it didn't work. You know, Ben Bernanke wrote a book, and everybody's been doing victory laps and going on tours, claiming a credit for this whole thing. And, you know, if this, this market tanks now, you know, I'm going to hold you guys responsible. And then Steve Leishman says, oh, like the Fed is, the re the Fed is responsible for North Korea uh, testing a, a hydrogen bomb. Like saying, oh, again, it's all because of North Korea. Forgetting about the fact that the market was down earlier in the week. We had a big drop on Monday. I mean, nuclear uh, North Korea didn't, didn't test any bombs on Monday. The only bomb that went off was just the bomb on, on Wall Street. We got earnings bombs going off, right? That's what's going on. But Steve Leesman is trying to whittle out of this by saying, well, it's, it's not the Fed's fault because, you know, they didn't know that North Korea was going to test a bomb. What, can you, are they going to use that as a reason to cut interest rates? Hey, everything was great. We cut it. We know we, we were raising rates. We we're getting ready to end QE. But now we got to we got to lower rates now because uh, now that North Korea has tested a hydrogen bomb, uh, that's a game changer. <laughs> I mean, these guys, all they're doing is making excuses Except now you've got Richard Fisher that's kind of letting the cat out of the bag. I mean, I wonder if he's getting an earful from his colleagues, especially since, again, he threw them under the bus. But nobody, nobody in the media is, is talking about that fact. Now, also in the markets today, while stocks were going down, gold was going up. Gold was up about, what, $16, $17. Gold hit a two-month high today. And, of course, as fast as it's going up in dollars, it's going up even faster in other currencies, like the Canadian dollar, which hit a new, what, nine-year low today, uh, the Australian dollar. Of course, the yen was up. In fact, the, the dollar-yen is really breaking down. And to me, that is a very scary proposition uh, for the markets to see this strength coming in the Japanese yen. Oil price is continuing to drop down about another $2 today. We're trading now below 34. We're trading in the 33s. Uh, gold stocks were up, but you know, you'd think that gold stocks would be up a lot more considering the fact that the cost for these mining companies is really plunging because their labor costs are going down because they're in Canadian dollars or Australian dollars. Their energy costs are collapsing and their revenue is going up. So Wall Street is still oblivious uh, to the bargains that exist in the mining stocks. But of course, certainly a year to date, uh, the mining stocks are up and they're probably the only uh, sector of the market that it is up. And I can tell you, nobody on Wall Street owns these stocks. If anything, they're short these stocks. And so they're losing money on these stocks and the stocks that they're long, they're losing money on too. But, you know, while everybody was talking about what was going on in North Korea, we got a lot of economic news that came out. And most of it, as is typically the case, was bad. All right. Let's start with the news that came out yesterday on vehicle sales. You know, everybody has been excited about vehicle sales and they were a big disappointment. In fact, we're at a six month low. I mean, yes, last year was a record for auto sales. 
But December was a six-month low. And that was despite all of these uh, Christmas giveaways, right, where they were really trying to get you in on, you know, Black Friday or whatever it was. There were a lot of sales going on. And still, uh, it was very disappointing. They were looking for uh, domestic sales of 14.2 million. They got 13.9 million. They were looking for total sales, which includes international, of 18.1 million. They got 17.3 million. Uh, and meanwhile, too, the inventory to sales ratios continues to rise. It is at a new high since the 2008 2009 Great Recession. Also, if you look at what's going on in the auto stocks, GM got clobbered again today. It was down about 4%, a little over 3.5% by the close. It's down about 9% so far this year. The year just started. GM is down 9%. It's now down more than 20% from its 52-week high that it traded at you know, late last year. That's a bear market. So what does this tell you? You know, the inventory to sales ratios are climbing, right? All these unsold cars are piling up, uh, you know, in the showrooms. And General Motors stock is in a bear market. That's telling me that the auto bubble is over. It's popped. And this is the biggest bubble yet. When you look at the number of people who are leasing versus buying, look at the length of the uh, the, the loans, uh, how long people are borrowing, you know, seven, eight year loans, the credit quality of the borrowers. And of course, all these people that were induced into buying cars they couldn't afford with cheap financing are about to lose their jobs. First of all, there's going to be a lot of layoffs in the automobile sector. Look, if the auto companies, if General Motors, Ford, if they got a lot of cars they can't sell, what does that mean? That means they're going to stop producing them. Why produce more cars when you can't sell the cars you've already produced, right? So now there's all kinds of layoffs in production at the factories. And these are good jobs, right? These are high-paying jobs. They're going to go. Also, they're not going to need as many car salesmen, right? If they, you know, people aren't buying cars, they don't need people to sell cars. But what about all the supplies? You know, there's a lot of companies in the auto supply chain, that feed off of the car production and the car sales. So when GM doesn't produce as many cars, they don't need as many parts. So the layoffs are basically going to you know, trickle down throughout the entire automobile sector. And again, these are higher paying jobs that are going to disappear. And some of these people have car loans that they're not going to be able to repay. What about all the people that work in retail? You know, I've said, and I was saying it all last year, that Starting in January of 2016, we were going to start to see all the layoffs, right? Because I saw the retail sales numbers were horrible. And they were disappointing. Stock prices were falling. I said, you know, people probably don't want to lay people off at the end of the year. You know, it's a downer to put a pink slip in somebody's stocking. So people wait till after the new year to start laying people off. And sure enough, after the close today, Macy's announced a $400 million restructuring. They're closing stores. They're laying off thousands of workers because of disappointing sales throughout the year and during the holiday season. And so it begins, right? It's not just Macy's. It's all these retailers. They're all laying people off. Now, how many of these people that work at Macy's you think bought a car in the last uh, couple of years based on these cheap terms? I bet a lot of these people who are being laid off have car payments. Well, are they going to be able to make their car payments once they're laid off? I don't think so. <laughs> What's going to happen? Well, maybe the car will get repossessed. But I think you're going to see a huge blow up in the securitized market for auto loans because a lot of people have been buying up those auto loans that's the reason that the auto companies were able to extend credit because there's a bubble where the fuel comes from the federal reserve but this whole thing is blowing up right now and again the layoffs are coming the low unemployment rate is the rear view mirror right looking at what's happening in the actual economy through the windshield is a disaster for jobs and you know to me i think i've said this before but i mean this is deja vu uh, because it's just like 2008. I mean, and I, get, I remember that by 2008, I mean, the subprime market had already exploded. The problems in the housing market should have been obvious. Yet everybody was saying, oh, don't worry about it. It's contained. And, you know, I was, 
I thought, my God, all the things that I've been predicting for the past few years, they're happening right now. Why can't anybody see it? People were still denying what I was saying, laughing at what I was saying, even though we were actually already in the Great Recession that I had been predicting. The financial crisis had already begun. It's just that people hadn't figured it out yet because nobody had rung the bell. I guess that didn't happen until Lehman Brothers went under, or maybe not even then. Maybe it was uh, Merrill Lynch getting bought out or whatever it was that was finally the bell when people realized, and Jim Cramer was on CNBC, you know, they know nothing. By then it was too late. But even, even earlier in the year, it should have been obvious. Well, it, this is the same thing now. A lot of the stuff that I have been warning about for the last several years is unfolding right now in real time before our eyes, yet everybody is just as oblivious as they were in 2008 to the financial crisis, even though they should have known. So to me, you know, this is all going to be happening relatively soon. I don't know how many months it's going to take uh, before this happens. Let's go over some of the economic numbers that came out that, that show me that we are probably already in a recession officially. Now, I know a lot of people, you know, give me flack for saying, what do you mean, Peter? saying we're going into a recession. Haven't we been, you've been saying we're in a recession the whole time. Yes, I believe that we've never recovered, that we've been in a recession. I am always talking about an official recession because nobody wants to admit it because, you know, the government cooks the books, the, the, the inflation numbers aren't honest. And so officially we haven't been in a recession. I'm talking about an official recession where even the government's own rigged numbers show negative GDP, meaning the economy is so bad that it's even negative in the official reports, which means it's really, really bad when that happens. So apart from the lousy vehicle sales we got yesterday, look at the numbers that we came out today. Now, first of all, we did get a positive number this morning coming from ADP, right? This is the jobs number, and this was way above estimates, right? They, the consensus was 190,000, and the print was 257,000, way above estimates. And I, you know, a lot of people on Wall Street you know, took solace in this to say, ah, you see, the economy is strong. Don't worry about anything because we're creating all these jobs. Look, it doesn't make any sense that this number was this big because even if, if you look at the PMIs that are coming out, the ISM numbers that are coming out, if you look at the employment components of those reports, they're horrible. They're showing big reductions in jobs. So how is ADP reporting so much hiring in December? I don't trust this number. And I think if you go back historically and look, ADP has massively gone back and revised its numbers months and months later, not even the next month, but six months later, they'll go back and they'll say, oh, we were way wrong. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we sharpened our pencils and we did it again and we were off by a mile. I think they're going to end up doing that with this number, right? I think this number is optimistic on their part. I think it's been influenced by, I don't know if it's seasonality or, you know, birth death assumptions, but I don't believe the ADP because there's no way the ADP is right and the ISM is right and the, uh, the PMIs are right. So, one of these reports is wrong. You got to decide which one you think is wrong because they can't all be right because some reports are showing, uh, you know, job losses and some are showing these job gains. So someone's wrong and someone's right. And based on what I'm observing anecdotally, it's the ADP numbers that seem wrong. But of course, Wall Street wants to grab onto the ADP because it's good and they want to dismiss all the other information because it's bad. Now, the trade deficit on the surface right, didn't appear that bad. We got the November trade deficit this morning of $42.4 billion, and that was slightly better, right, or not, or, or less worse. I don't want to say better when you have a $42 billion trade deficit in one month. That is awful. <laughs> you know, so, so it wasn't as awful as we thought. We thought it would be $44.4 billion. Instead, it was $42.4, but they did revise the prior month up from $43.9 to $44.6. So it wasn't as bad as it could have been, and it wasn't as bad as it was the prior month, but it was still bad. But here is the devil in the detail. The reason that the trade deficit went down is because our imports fell less than our exports, right? Everything went down. We exported less. We imported less. That shows a shrinking economy. Our imports were actually at the lowest level in five years. Now, what does that mean? You know, if we're importing the lowest amount of stuff in five years, that's got to be because of the slowing economy. Now, some of that is because oil is less expensive. 
Um, but you know, a lot of it has to do with the fact that we're now importing less stuff because consumers are buying less stuff. That's why Macy's is selling less stuff, and that's why they're laying people off. So to me, this trade deficit reflects a weakening economy, the fact that we saw declines in both imports and exports. But now here's where the bad news begins. We got a PMI uh, services index out for December. That was 56.1 last month. I'm not sure what they were looking for, but the print this month was 54.3. And so we're going in the wrong direction. And I think, you know, in a few more months, we're going to be sub 50. And that's going to indicate uh, contraction. Remember, all of the manufacturing numbers are already sub 50. Uh, it's just the service sector that's lagging behind. But I think manufacturing leads the service sector. Wall Street wants to pretend that what happens in manufacturing stays in manufacturing, right? Like, oh, don't worry about these problems. They're contained to the manufacturing sector. So don't have to worry about them, right? They're as contained as the, sub as the mortgage problems were contained to subprime, right? Let's look at the factory orders that came out. That was a disaster. This was... Uh, for November, well, actually, it wasn't a disaster because it, it, it met expectations. They were looking for minus 0.2, and we got minus 0.2, but they did downwardly revise the prior month from up 1.5 to up 1.3. But year over year, we're now down year over year for the 13th consecutive month. Now, the last time this happened was in the Great Recession of 2008, 2009, and then the time before that it happened well, was in the big recession following, uh, you know, the bursting of the dot-com bubble and the 9-11 attacks. But the only time you see stuff like this is in a recession. You never see it at any other time. Uh, and so, you know, either we're in a recession or this is some kind of fluke. And again, to me, it's more likely that we are in a recession. And that's why we're getting data that only happens when you're in a recession. But probably the most troubling number should be the ISM number that came out for the day uh, for December ISM. Uh, last month was 55.9. They were once again looking for a improvement to 56.2. Instead, we sank down to 55.3. Uh, this is the lowest level in, I don't know, a year and a half, two years, something like that. And we're continuing to move down in the service sector. And again, you're going to see more and more declines in the months ahead, especially with the, the wealth effect, right? Because the phony wealth effect that Dick Fisher admitted to having orchestrated, engineered at the Fed, well, as that phony wealth is going away, you're going to have the reverse wealth effect. And what is the wealth effect, right? People feel richer, so they go out and spend money that they wouldn't have spent if they realized how poor they were. Well, when the wealth effect wears off, people realize, oh my God, I made a bunch of mistakes. I shouldn't have bought that. I shouldn't have done that because I don't have all the money I thought I had. And now I have to behave differently, right? It's like, you know, imagine if you thought you won the lottery and, and, and then you, you, know, you went in, you quit your job and you did all sorts of things and then you found out that you read your ticket wrong. You were off by a digit and you didn't win anything. Now what do you got to do? Now you're in a lot of trouble, right? You got to go apologize to your boss, hope you can get your job back. I mean, maybe you bought some stuff that you really got to get out of some of these deals because you can't afford to do it. So as this, you know, this wealth effect works in reverse, what's going to happen to the service sector of the economy? The service sector is going to implode. It's not contained to manufacturing. Now, also today, we got the Fed minutes from the last FOMC meeting in which the Fed raised interest rates, right, in December for the first time. And if you remember, that was unanimous, right? There was no dissension. And, you know, part of the reason for that was that the Fed wanted to show that everybody was on board. This was another, this was part of the confidence show, right? We're so confident that we can raise rates that we're all in agreement. Nobody dissented. Nobody was worried. Everybody uh, supported the rate hike. And again, that was part of the show to instill a false sense of confidence in both the economy uh, and, uh, and the markets. And you know what? It ain't working. But when we got the minutes today, the minutes showed a different story. The minutes showed that it wasn't unanimous, that there were members who were against raising rates. Right. They had to be convinced they were worried that the economy was not strong enough or that inflation was not high enough. And so they really didn't want to raise rates, but they were convinced by their colleagues to do it. The question is, why didn't they dissent? Why, you know, why did they you know, get their minds right? And even though they didn't want to raise rates, 
Why did they pretend that they did? And again, they did it to try to to put on a false sense of confidence. It's kind of like, you know, sometimes congressmen, they make a vote because they know their vote doesn't impact the outcome. So they're allowed to vote in a certain way because they can they can, you know, show their constituents. So I I think once the the, the dissenters realized that, well, the Fed was going to raise rates anyway. Their dissent didn't matter. They decided to just, you know, for, you know, take one for the team and just, you know, make it unanimous and just cover up their, their concerns. But of course, now it's out in the open now that we've got these Fed minutes. So I'm not really sure what they were trying to accomplish. In fact, even in that Dick Fisher talk, when he talked about why the Fed didn't raise rates in September. He actually mentioned that, you know, the markets were weak and so they held off and then the markets recovered and they looked okay. And so we decided to go in December. He's actually admitting that, you know, they they didn't do it in September because the markets were falling. But then when it looked like the markets were blessing the rate hike because everybody was expecting it and the markets weren't going down, the Fed felt confident enough to raise rates. That's exactly what I said. Remember what I said? I said, if the Fed is going to be fooled by this and lulled into a false sense of confidence that the markets are blessing this rate hike, I said, they got another thing coming. Because once the market actually has to deal with a rate hike, it's going down. Because again, there's nothing left to hold it up. Think about where the market is, right? We are at nosebleed valuations. Companies have loaded up on debt, buying back stock. Profits are falling. Sales are falling. And the Fed is raising rates. I mean, you you couldn't imagine a worse scenario for the stock market. I mean, it's got nowhere to go but down. And the thing is, when is it going to stop falling? How much lower is the Fed going to let the market go, right? How much air is going to allow to come out of this bubble before it it comes to its rescue? Because, again, I disagree with Fisher. They're not out of ammo. The Fed's not going to say, hey, we're out of ammo. Nothing we could do. And wait, wait till some of these, uh, you know, bad loans start to, you know, go into default and some of the financial institutions. I mean, what's going to happen when this whole thing unravels? And the one thing that hasn't happened yet, the nail in the coffin, is the reversal in the dollar. You know, the dollar is still strengthening against most currencies. You know, it's been down against the yuan. The Chinese yuan has been falling. And everybody's been making a big deal about the weakness in yuan. Look, the yuan is going down against the dollar. It's not going down against the other currencies. I mean, it's going down against the yen now because even the dollar is going down against the yen. But the yuan is not really weakening that much. The Chinese are trying to let the yuan mimic other currencies. They've already said that. They said they want the yuan to trade, you know, not just be fixed to the dollar. Well, this is going to work both ways. You know, everybody is expecting the yuan to collapse, right? You know, Kyle Bass, who was one of the guys that got it right in subprime, he's getting it wrong, I think, in the yuan. I mean, he looks like he's right now. He's been recommending uh, that, you know, you short the yuan because he's going to get killed. I think this is a sucker move. It's a bear trap. The real move in the yuan is going to be way up because what's going to happen when the dollar reverses and start to fall against all the other currencies, China is going to let it fall against the yuan. See, when the Fed did QE1 and QE2 and the dollar was tanking against all the other currencies, it wasn't tanking against the yuan because the Chinese interfered. They wouldn't let it happen. They're not going to do it next time. That's what they're telling us. That is the big difference. That's the game changing event. So everybody is worried about the yuan going down. They should really be worrying about the dollar going down because the next time it goes down, it's going down for the count. It's not going to be saved by the bell. I mean, last time, ironically, the dollar collapse was saved by the financial crisis. Well, next time, it's not a financial crisis. The Fed isn't going to let that happen. It's going to be a dollar crisis. And ultimately, it's going to be a sovereign debt crisis in the United States when people realize what good is being repaid in currency that has very little value. That is the crisis that's coming. But still, so far, people remain oblivious to that reality, just like they remained oblivious to the reality of the 2008 financial crisis right up until we're about to go over the edge of the cliff. Well, we're now, you know, pulling up to an even bigger cliff and we're still about to go over the edge. And everybody else who was blind last time is just as clueless this time. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is. 
Truth and Media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthandmedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, truthandmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthandmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into The Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthandmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access the Truth and Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They are all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com.